It's a pleasure to be here at the ARC to share with you um, the observations made and lessons learned in our 30 years of practice as landscape architects and urban designers. Um, I hope that uh, my talk here will in some small way create a greater awareness of the now and set about a more mindful planning and design strategies for creating new cities and rejuvenating existing urban megacities. Uh, from our office here in Chinatown, my colleagues and I work on local and global projects. Traveling through uh, uh, what we are facing right now is that we live in the urban millennium where the, for the first time in the history of the world, the majority of the projected 12 billion people will live in cities by 2050. China alone will build 300 new cities the size of Chicago. In India, we'll build 300 new campuses, basically campus cities the size of University of Virginia. Traveling throughout the world, um, I've seen the devastating effect of our human uh, species dwelling on this planet. Uh, we must find a better way. Albert Einstein just described insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We have our own challenges locally. Looking at the Chesapeake Bay watershed area, it's a landmass of over 64,000 square miles, including six states. And in, in what was one of the most bountiful environments, ecosystem found anywhere in the world. At the present time, there's more paved and non-permeable surfaces in the local watershed than not, but we keep building more. And some, some folks might say, so what's the big deal? We need to reduce the commuting time, right? Well, the big deal is, is that uh, the water draining off does not get absorbed to recharge our aquifers. This is a huge problem when everybody's talking about us facing a uh, water shortage uh, now. There are oils and toxins and heavy metals and fertilizers and animal waste from livestock and poultry combined with the water to create dead zones, as I showed you before. The red zone in that diagram is all areas without oxygen. So. If you're a fish, crab, or oyster, and you have no oxygen in the water, you're dead, and you never get to make it to the legal seafood buffet. <laughs> we live in a, what are we supposed to do? We live in a very perilous world, which seems so fragile in so many accounts. There seems to be so much chaos, injustice, and crisis all around us. As human beings, we're in constant search for inspiration to make things better. In times of great division and fear, we must also search for common ground. Throughout the history of the world, one source of that inspiration has been in nature. Man is part of nature. We are of this place. Not only in the DNA are we connected, but also in the mathematical proportions that carry us through all of us, all living things that inhabit this planet. Leonardo's drawing is shown here. Uh, is it recognizable instantly? What is not widely known is that the diagram shows the human body's proportional relationship to be 1 to 0 0.618. The ratio is referred to in a designer's language as the golden rule or the golden mean. It is the core principle of uh, Georgie Doxy's book, The Power of Limits, Proportional Harmonies in Nature, Art, and Architecture. Yeah, the guy was an architect, and uh, uh, the book was published more than 100 years ago. Man and nature are one, and every living organism shows the same ratio. There are no snowflakes alike, but they all share the same ratio. They all fit, too, the objects of beauty recognized by all cultures. The whole planet is filled of sacred, monumental, mystical places, all built by ancestors in different cultures spread out all across the globe. But at closer glance, they all share the same proportion and ratio. Did our ancestors arrive at this wisdom by watching nature and its pattern around them? If you design and build something with great respect and mindfulness, is that the natural result? I hold a collective knowledge of the world at my fingertips, moving at 4G. <laughs> the question is, what do we do with all that knowledge? Let's ask Siri. Siri, tell me what to do. <clears throat> if possible, please make a legal U-turn. 
Okay, so we go back to nature. Uh, let's look at the tree. Everybody knows that we wouldn't be here without them. They give us nuts, fruits, paper, pulp, bounties of the tree. Oh, yeah, they also exhale oxygen. If we look at the tree as a community instead of what we can do with them after they're dead, it's quite extraordinary. Working on a uh, resource park project to save the last remnants of the rainforest in Borneo, I met Dr. Peter Ashton of Harvard's Arnold Arboretum. Scientist. He shared with me an experiment that he'd been conducting for years. He took a uh, large track of rainforest in the Amazon and took periodic aerial photos. This was before Google Earth. And identifying over 50 or so canopy species. In the rainforest, life and death comes at you fast. Things decay so quickly. Topsoil is very shallow. So when a tree dies and the canopy opens up, another tree promptly takes his place. What he found after years of observation was amazing. As trees died and were replaced, different colors moved around, if you were to color code these uh, 50 species, in a seemingly random pattern. But when the music stopped and you took the count again, the same balance of ratio of the tree species remained in that large expanse of space. So what does that mean? Do trees actually practice? Does a, does a tree community practice reciprocity? Oh, no, please, it's your turn to shine. No, 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 you, you, no, wait a minute, no. <laughs> Here's the water cycle in nature without man's intervention. The, the, it just works, it, it works just fine. It, it, it cleanses the water, it stores the water, it, you know, it puts clean water back into the ocean and the rivers. And that's because the tree in the forest takes care of all that. When a, when a tree, when the rain falls in the forest, very little of it, it actually runs off by the surface, somewhere between 15, 20, 25 percent, depend, depending on the, the microclimate of that, of that forest. When the rain falls here, because we have so much non-permeable sur surfaces, it pretty much washes out into these huge pipes. And if you've ever been to Main and O Street, those, pumps, the, the, those pipes that go down into that area, you could drive a Humvee through some of them. But as large as they are, they're not big enough to hold the storm surges because of the development that's occurred. So what that means is, in the nation, in nation's capital, of one of well, the most powerful country in the world, 40 times a year, we have a combined sewer and storm, which puts raw sewage into the Anacostia River about 40 times. So what do we do? Well, I think some you know, biomimicry would help. How do we take an urban street and mimic the nature? We take it in the tree pits and use the tree pits as a sponge. Barracks Road was done about 10 years ago. It was the first low-impact development project in the city. And we treated all the sidewalk water, holding them and releasing it slowly. The next project, the one you see coming out of the ground, which used to be the old convention center, and you know the old convention center was not permeable, right? So what's, re what's, what's replacing that now is a project which is called City Center, where we, we uh, used the, uh, the gardens of Babylon to create green roofs, some which are accessible, some which are not, but all spongible, where all, all the water is collected and treated and reused. And we up the ante on this one, where not only are we treating the sidewalk water, but we're also treating the street water, too. The Fort Belvoir Hospital, replacement hospital for Walter Reed, also gave us a chance to really get into the full repertoire of, of, uh, of, of tools available, where we use green roof, rain gardens, bioswales, because this is actually in a very, very uh, sensitive area of the Chesapeake, a bird sanctuary area, where we were able to get all the water, once again reusing them, cleansing them, and releasing it slow, slowly into the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Basin. So here you see the full scale of the urban model, the suburban model you saw in Fort Belvoir, but here, even in farms and, uh, and rural areas and parks where you can actually use these swale systems to basically filter uh, uh, fertilizer, animal waste, or whatever you have. So we thought, geez, you know, Europeans seem to know a lot about this stuff. So we sent one of our senior associates to London Sustainability Conference. And what she came back and reported was astonishing because they, she said, you know, these Germans, they really know green roofs, you know. But they're not really doing this stuff on the ground like we're doing. So we took the opportunity of an international competition in Seoul, Korea, the city of my birth. And uh, <clears throat> we said, let's go ahead and bottle all this stuff so we can actually test all the ideas here. 
And one of the things that happened here was that we used all the strategies that I just talked about, but we also said, it's right next to this huge sewage waste treatment plant, so is there a way to actually uh, extract energy from that? And consulting with a lot of different uh, experts and scientists and engineers, we were actually able to take the energy from small turbines, using hydro, using solar, but and, and the temperature difference between the, uh, the sewage waste treatment to basically get, uh, provide all the energy for the new development that, 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 that we were proposing, plus exporting energy for 3,000 homes in the, in the area. The other experiment that we did on this project was that restoring the wetlands, what we, what we realized was that if we created a habitat for migratory birds and provided food, they would actually bring back the seeds and reforest that area to the point that it would be the original forest that once inhabited the banks of the Han River in Seoul, Korea. So that was quite exciting. So we said, once we gain some notoriety uh, of looking at these uh, regenerative cities at a large scale, we were given the commission to design a 4,000-acre new city in Suzhou, China. And once again, we took a look at all the strategies by creating a green belt, green zone. It was basically on the rice paddy. So we were very, very mindful about how to keep the water edges uh, constant because uh, I don't know about you guys, but rice growing is a very, very fine art. The, the water level has to be just perfect. And I'm, just, I'm not telling you this just you know, as a farmer, but it, it is a well-known fact that it's, it's very, very difficult to grow rice. So by doing that, we created a, a, a sustainable plant, plan which actually gives you a build-out which is integrated with the ecosystem. And then here, once again, you know, we're always trying to up the ante every time we do a project. It's, you know, that's why we call it a practice. You, know, you keep practicing until you get it right, and uh, so the next project is always better. So we took a look at uh, where to put all the infrastructure, and, and it came to the conclusion that the low point of the site is not only makes sense because things slide downhill, but it also made sense because if you take municipal waste and take all the recycling out of it, which is a revenue, which is profit, it actually becomes municipal solid waste is just like sludge. And sludge and waste is something the whole world has a whole lot of. And now there's a new technologies in treating that bio, biomass, drying it and burning it to create fuel. And then extracting synthetic gas and methane that comes out of that to fire for additional 60% more efficiency in terms of energy generation. And when you're drying this stuff, you can also have, with the evaporation and condensation, you can actually provide pure water. Another way to look at uh, a campus that we're working on in India is that you can actually have a subway system or you know, streetcar system, very much like the one we're trying to put here in DC, without putting in the wires and infrastructure and all the junction boxes, because that costs, that has 40% more cost to the capital cost. Whereas you can dedicate a solar energy field dedicated for recharging the battery operated streetcar and sell it to the grid during the day when the, uh, when the costs are very high and then buy it back at night to recharge these cars when they need recharging at a lower rate. So you're actually using the grid as storage and a profit center. Culture. Um, We, uh, we were given the opportunity to design the, uh, the last leg of the Hajj, 1.7 kilometers. Um, this, this was a uh, tremendous opportunity, uh, what I call the ultimate pedestrian experience. We had to design the two of the most important spines, the path that Muhammad left Mecca and the one he returned. The inspiration for the shade canopy and the light, light, uh, light fixture Nature and form came to, to us in the, uh, in the form of a moon blossom in nature. You know, it gets pretty hot there. And, uh, and these open only at night, and uh, they were found in my garden. So taking that biomimicry to another level, this is what happened, you know, to, inter to be intermixed with the, uh, with the palm trees or these uh, canopies, which basically created his own architectural arch, but at the same time doubled as a shade structure during the day and as a light fixture in the evening. One of the, the most difficult challenges when you're designing public spaces is the organizational grid. 
the grid which every element needs to fit into to, for, the, for the whole place to act as a whole. And uh, I was struggling with this greatly. And uh, I came up with the, uh, I came up with the prayer rug as the organizational element. And uh, the whole design, as you saw before, was approved by the uh, governor of Mecca and the royal family. And they're now basically you know, gathering the land for, to make this project happen. But when, when I was asked to do the TED talk and the, the subject matter came up, I went back to check to see if the, the, the prayer rug fit the golden rule. And thank God, it does. <laughs> And I said, you know, is this a coincidence? So I said, well, you know, let's check it out. And you know, now we found that a, Prus a Prussian peasant rug, the Mexican weaving, and the Northwestern Lummi tribal pieces all fit the rule. And you know, what I observed today is that, uh, you know, Stanley's talk about the Kenti cloth and all these different ideas, you know, we're actually weaving our own carpet here. You know, it's like the uh, tapestry of creative economy. What made Mecca even more special for us was that we were working on the Pentagon Memorial at the same time. After the 9-11, the Lummi Nation from the Washington State, who decided to carve totem poles, totem healing for all three sites. But the Pentagon could not accept this general gift because they would have to accept all the gifts from everyone. Co coincidentally, we had also won the uh, uh, design competition for the 9-11 Memorial Grove on Kingman Island. And uh, when the tribal elders saw the, uh, and the master carver for the lamination, saw our proposed placement for the, uh, uh, for the lummy poles at the apex of the, of the fan-shaped grove that we had designed, he told us that it reminded him of the uh, ceremonial fan made of feathers that was, lift, that was helped to lift the spirits of the ancestors to the heavens. Uh, that would, that's what you call a design goosebump moment. <clears throat> Dazu is a capital of Buddhism in China. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site with awe-inspiring Buddhist figures and artifacts and whole temples carved right out of the rock, limestone rocks. And uh, we were actually hired to, we're still working on this project. We're doing the cultural tourism master plan for this whole region. But as amazing as it was to walk through these incredible places, I felt that something was missing, and I couldn't put my finger on it. Last summer, my wife and I took the whole family to a Buddhist retreat called Plum Village in Bordeaux, France. Our friends thought it was crazy that we're in, in the middle of the greatest wine country in the world, and we didn't drink a single drop of wine. The missing element was the monks and the people living in harmony with nature. People activate places. Like here at the Ark. Today, we all have a role in shaping our places. We're informed and understand that nature shows us the way to build and the way we live. With our awareness that we are a part of nature and not over it, and our ability to communicate and connect as never before, we can leave our grandchildren's children something of awe and inspirational that's natural and sp that natural and spiritual places have given me a better place. As a rainforest act as a community, we desperately need to uh, mindfully repair our own sense of community. That way, our cultural treasures, our natural, our natural heritage, and our very humanity will aspire to create communities of lasting value. Thank you very much. <laughs>